Varsity Club, welcome back to another Cascade Valley video. And after winning the national title, the all season's about to be crazy. Now to quickly recap our stats, Riley had 30, 3,058 passing yards with 32 touchdowns and 18 interceptions. Thornton had a little under 1,000 yards with 9 touchdowns and 5 interceptions. Turning the ball over was a problem. But the bright spot we had was Jason Barr. 2,006 yards rushing, 33 touchdowns. I mean, this man was absolutely incredible this year. Literally only fumbled four times, which... I mean, it's kind of a lot, but you know what? For him, a dude his size, that's good. We see Cedric Riley have a great year on the ground with 550 and two touchdowns. Sean Stewart, the touchdown vulture, had nine touchdowns and a little one under 500. Thornton had 114 with two touchdowns. In the air, we're going to see Jason Barr, leading receiver, because he was the only dude to really stay healthy. 52 grabs for 431 yards and five touchdowns. Uh, RJ Riley had 780 with four touchdowns. We see 730 and seven touchdowns for Robert Roth. Willis had four touchdowns. Baker led us with eight touchdowns. Despite missing what felt like the entire season, this dude was still very good when he was out there. We see Stewart with one. Four touchdowns by Terrence Williams, Jared Gold, and by Mike Hemphill, who again, literally caught 10 passes. He was a defensive playmaker and still scored on offense four times. That's wild. On the offensive line, Xavier Mason and Lauren Sims are some of our best guys getting pancake blocks with Jared Gold, who was laying people out left and right, and Marquez Smith. Uh, from a sack allow perspective, though, we want to talk about Xavier Mason. 10 sacks ultimately for him, but being a right tackle, we scramble a lot to the right. I'm not surprised. On defense, Josh Cole was literally a single touchdown away from 100 in the year. Ray Walton, Doug Hall, Matthew Fowler were all sort of there as well. Hemphill chimes in with 51 of his own. Tackles for loss, Josh Cole again with 26. Mark Mullins also crossing the 20 threshold with 22. From a sack perspective, though, you can't replace what Mullins did. 21 for him. We see eight from Bobby Edwards. We see uh, six from Jamal Patterson and Mario Moses, as well as Sean Lowe and Mr. Josh Cole. Interception wise, Hemphill had nine. John Hall had nine. We see five by Fowler, four by Hall, three by Walton, and a whole lot of guys uh, that ultimately had one. But then the big thing we want to ultimately look at here is who had the most touchdowns. Hemphill had four. Doug Hall had two, including the crazy one in the national title game. Then one by Hall and one by Mario Moses. We had a big guy touchdown too. Kicking the ball, Hancock was great. 13 for 13. He made every single field goal that he attempted. We see a long of 51. Uh, extra points, 92 of 93. Yes, we'll still mad a little bit about the one that he missed, but again, he was fantastic. Punting Barnes, an award winner, had over 1,200 yards with a 41.1 average. Uh, we see Hempel only have 15 kick returns, 306 yards. No one really returned a kick return for a touchdown. Punt return for a touchdown as well. Not a lot to love. We'll eventually get better at having guys dominate that side of the ball, but again, special teams just isn't really our forte. One of the crazy things to me is we've now won 30 games in a row as a school, which is incredible, but the target is on our back. Some big schools are moving to our conference this offseason and some big time playmakers are on the move. Things are about to get even more spicy. We've been increasing the difficulty every single episode and things are getting a little bit closer, but still we need more of a challenge and it's coming. Now there is some movement in the off season. Oklahoma State ends up taking Phil Longo from us and well, that's gonna hurt because we needed him and we end up seeing what ultimately happens and we get Mike Gundy as our offensive coordinator. He's a man, he's 40. And it feels like this happens every single year. Whenever we do well and win well and play big, we see our offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator leave. Todd Graham leaves as our defensive coordinator who did a fantastic job. And well, we're gonna see what ultimately happens, but we gotta fill that ASAP. And then on the defensive side, we end up getting Spence Nowinski on a three-year deal. Who knows if he'll ultimately end up staying that long, but again, not the greatest prestige. We've got a whole lot of work to do because we had two great coaches that were helping our team a ton and now they've left, which leaves a giant hole. Now, this is going to be, I think, the craziest offseason for us in Cascade Valley history. Cedric Riley, a 96 overall redshirt sophomore, is declaring for the NFL draft. And I, as much as I want him to stay, convincing him would be difficult. I mean, you can basically see right now we could promise him, you know, not regretting to stay. Every single thing we even say, the Heisman, the national title, whatever, it's low. So it's not even worth trying to get him to stay. Robert Roth, an incredible receiver for us, is declaring for the NFL draft as well. He's going to be a second rounder. And again, I don't want to hold these guys back because they're so talented. Mario Moses, who sort of had an OK year, is not wanting to go. But Chris Moore is trying to transfer to LSU. This is the dude that we redshirted. We sat him for a year. Riley's leaving. This is an opportunity for Moore to compete for the starting job with Thornton. But he's going to go to LSU? We have to try to get this dude back. This is one of the most important ones. Oh my God, it's very low for everything. Oh no, Moore was the running back. Since he's a quarterback, it's saying 200 carries. 
if you look at his stats, though, his speed and acceleration are okay. Throw power is incredible. Throw accuracy has got some work to be done. We need this dude. So, I mean, I think the big thing is you tell him he'll play in more than nine games. We'll figure out a way. We'll make him involved in the game plan, but we need this dude back. He's transferring. No! We lost him. We have David Clark, a right guard, transferring. Honestly, we don't care at this point. David Clark can be gone at this point. PJ Bean is trying to transfer. The coach is leaving. He wants to go uh, with him to Nevada or go differently to Nevada. PJ Bean will have an opportunity to play. I think for him, he's got a medium chance. I say we you're going to play in more than nine games. That's definitely the case. And look, I have to sit down with my parents. I can go either way right now. Please stay. Okay, so we need more. Okay, you have more than 40 tackles. We'll have more than five sacks. I don't know if we can make this promise because what if he doesn't get more than five sacks? We got to make the promise. We'll have to make it work. We just told you we promised you. I hate you. Bobby Edwards is going to stay, which is a huge W. He was fantastic. We need all the help we can get on the defensive line, especially with Mario Moses ultimately leaving. Mark Mons is going to stay, which is a shocker because he is significantly better than Mario Moses despite a lower rating. That is huge. Uh, Ray Walton, though, John Hall, Doug Hall, Josh Cole, Ben Oliver, Jamal Patterson, Lauren Sims, Austin Houston. I mean, all these guys were great in their own right, but they're essentially going to be gone. And you know what? Hats off to them. They're going to the NFL draft. They're seniors. They did their job, but we lost some big ones. All right, look, now that I'm thinking about it with a young quarterback in Thornton or some other guy we're going to have to go to try to find in the offseason, I want to try to get Robert Roth back. We're going to promise that he won't regret to stay and get his college degree. Okay, he needs more time. Okay. Oh, man. These are tough. Guaranteed conference championship. I. Yeah. I, if I say, can I get another car? You know what? Go. I don't have that kind of money. So the draft results are in, and honestly, I don't blame some of these dudes for what they ultimately went out there for. Robert Roth goes in the first round. Ray Walton uh, ends up going in the first round as well. Massive players that did incredible things for us, and they deserve it. And I don't blame Robert Roth for ultimately going out and wanting a car. He can buy a lot more now. Moses goes in the second round. Doug Hall's a fourth rounder, and John Hall is a fourth runner as well. Some teams got some steals. I want to know who you guys think ultimately was the best out of here, but you know what? Our guys did their thing. Also, wait, I'm just now realizing... Cedric Riley did not get drafted. Karma. Now, I'm always interested if we get transfer requests, but no one really wants to transfer here for some reason, okay? We could have used a quarterback. Now, signing day has come, and we got some players, but also lost out on some players. We went big on Craig Norris, but some other teams went even bigger. They were putting like 15,000 points in this dude, and we ultimately lose out on him. We did get Malik Newsom, a really talented athlete that I'm really excited about. We do not get Jordan Singleton. He ends up going to Wake Forest. We lose out on him. Uh, Brandon Revels, a very talented receiver we end up getting, which is great news for us. Donovan Ruffin, who is an underrated corner we don't get. The dude that I'm the most upset about is this kid, Jordan Braithwaite Jr. He was a 70 overall quarterback just sitting out there. We found him. He was actually a jam at plus seven, and he had really good stats. Wasn't super elusive or talented. I think we put um, like 9,000 points into him. And we still fall 4,700 uh, shy. But a guy that we did get, though, was Jalen Clark, a receiver that's a four-star that is an absolute monster. And I cannot wait to get this dude in the field. And so when you net out where our class ultimately sat, again, we were a top five class. No five stars, but 10 four-stars, 14 three-stars, and a single two-star out there. This is a W, in my opinion. And we have some great players this season, and we want to go ahead and make sure we get guys situated where they ultimately need to be. So first up is going to be Demel Hill, a 78 overall athlete. We thought maybe wide receiver was his calling, but the more that I look, he's actually his highest rated at free safety. So we're going to move him there because we have a couple of guys that he can honestly compete with as a freshman and possibly start. Jaquez Simmons is a massive human being, only a three star, but six foot six, 263 pounds, and was a plus sign overall. Now we looked at a lot of different spots for him, but his highest overall is going to be at center, and we need some help there. So he could potentially start year one or sit year one and come back year two and be an absolute monster. Now, something I didn't expect to have to do with this season, but I think this will work out ultimately in the end for us. Joe Kendrick, who was a really talented athlete coming in, we ended up moving him to halfback because we had a long jam at quarterback, but now we necessarily don't. And he's got 85 throw power, 82 throw accuracy. We're going to move him over to the quarterback position where he's also a 75 overall. He could play a lot of different spots for us, potentially really mostly on offense or on defense at corner. But with the need that we have on offense at 
quarterback. We need somebody back there in case Thornton isn't that guy. Brian Pancotti is an interesting dude as well. Uh, 6'2", 185. Only 88 speed, acceleration is an 86. He's not super talented, and I thought he would have been a little bit better, but we're going to put him in halfback and just see maybe what happens, but he might not even make the team. Malik Newsom is 5'11", 178, and he was a dude that I was super hyped about. But again, as we look at where he maybe translates, I don't really quite know where he's ultimately going to fit. If we look at some of his attributes, 91 speed, 86 acceleration, elusiveness, ball carrier vision, things of that nature aren't very high. He can't play a lot of positions, potentially receiver we can maybe look at having him play, but... There's sort of a log jam there, but I think for now we'll stash him at receiver. We don't need even halfback. We just need to figure out a spot where maybe he can go, learn, train, and be better. One of my favorite things to look at, though, is the training results. Bobby Edwards, who was an 80 overall when he came in as a freshman, is now a true senior at 96 overall. An absolute stud. And QB Cedric Thornton now has the keys to the ship, and it's going to see what he can ultimately do. We see Joe Kendrick actually go down, spending his year at halfback last year, trying to transition to quarterback. It was honestly kind of tough for him. So Thornton goes up four. We lose one with Kendrick. Uh, Jason Barr goes up four, which is a W. Stewart goes up plus five. We see Barr now have 98 speed. Acceleration is already maxed out. These are major movements for us. At fullback, George Barrett has been a quiet storm for us, blocking, making plays, and just picking up the loose ends when we need him to. Uh, we see a wide receiver, Jeremy Willis, now our top rated receiver to 92 overall. RJ Riley goes up plus two to a 90 for his junior year. Tom Baker also a junior goes up plus three. Terrence Williams now a redshirt sophomore at plus four. And then we're going to see uh, Matt Wilson, the freshman who was redshirted last year, go up plus five. And that speed is going to be dangerous. Jared Gold is now a senior, which is hard to believe. He's a 91 overall with Anthony Minor being right behind him at an 89 with plus three. Left tackle, we're going to see an 87 for Chris Johnson. Uh, Marquez Smith is now going to be an 80 overall as a junior. And then Stephen May is now going to be a 72. At left guard, we get an 83 with Jason Miller plus six. Uh, Shane Walker goes up plus four, and Lane Atkins decided not to train at all. At center, again, there's going to be a bit of a log jam here. James Jackson at 79 with plus three. Wesley Gaines goes up plus five. We see Sean Hood go up plus six, and Mendoza go up plus five as well. At right guard, we're going to see Derek Simpson go up plus three to a 75. Right tackle, we see Xavier Mason go up plus six to an 88, with Roy Ray being there as a redshirt freshman at 75. At plus six, uh, left end, we're going to see Mark Mullins now to an 89. This dude should have been in the 90s, in my opinion. I don't know how this dude is rated so low, but it is what it is at this point. Um, he goes up plus 289. You see Ken Manson as a senior go up plus three, and Tony Rutledge goes up plus six as a sophomore. He'll be next in line once we see Mullins and Manson ultimately graduate. At right end, David Jones, who was honestly pretty solid when he came in and spelled uh, Moses last season, is a 78 overall plus three. Uh, Pat Hill is now going to be a 73 with a plus four. And then John Doucette is now a 70 overall with a plus two. Defensive tackle has one very, very good player and then some holes behind him. But again, and you've seen the plus six for Edwards, the plus four for Corey Brown, plus five for Sean Anderson, and plus two for Bobby Cunningham. Uh, I left outside linebacker. Chris Bass gets a major jump up, plus five to an 84 as a true sophomore. Steven Sampson's up plus three. And Isaiah Holman also goes up plus four. Middle linebacker, there's going to be a hole here. So Leonard Morgan is going to go up plus two as a true freshman. I'm sorry, a redshirt freshman. Alvarez goes up plus four to a 68. And Christensen decided not to train this all season again probably someone from left outside comes over to the middle but we'll figure that out when the time comes and then right outside linebacker we're gonna have sean Lowe, or excuse me steven low as an 82 with plus four and then chris jordan again decided not to train we are going to desperately miss pj beam because you can imagine if we had been able to keep him here it would have been great but instead he went to go play for nevada what are you doing corner is still going to be a very good position for us fowler now takes the ultimate leap to go a plus three of an 89 the most surprising thing, though, is Mike Hemphill does not go up at all. He's been very good, and he struggled at the end of last season. But his junior year, he doesn't improve at all. So we'll ultimately want to watch that and see what he does. But that's not a good sign for one of the most dominant players we've ever had going into his junior year. Plus four for Bernard Harvey. We see Dwayne Cole not go up at all as well as a senior year. That's not a good sign. Jeremy Gross goes up plus one, and James Mitchell up plus two with John Hunter again not really doing much of anything. At free safety, Matt Whitaker will be a senior at a plus three overall at an 80. We see Will Hayes, the redshirt freshman, at a 75. Uh, and then at strong safety, we're going to see Tim Wade at a 78, losing three spots there. And then Jay Coleman at a 76. There's a chance we'll look and see what ultimately happens, but Coleman could take over Wade's spot depending on how those plays work out in the early part of the season. And then a kicker, the always money Kirk Hancock goes up plus two to 94. And then our punter goes up plus three to 93. This is a very, very good team still, but we have a lot of holes and 
a lot of question marks. In the offseason, some wild things have been happening. College football is known that conferences are going to be moving around. And with the SEC bolstering up, some big name players have maybe left the SEC and left the Pac-12 to join the Big Ten. We have LSU joining the east side of the conference. And on the western side, we have USC. Yes, the same team that maybe took one of our major players at LSU. They're back in our conference. So a quick rundown of our redshirted roster. Uh, this dude, Clark Antonovich, is some dude that I don't know how he got on our team. Must have been a family friend of someone because I didn't recruit this dude, but he's here. So we're just redshirting him because we can't cut him. Uh, at halfback, Brian Pincotti is going to be gone in terms of the redshirt level because he's not going to be able to compete with Stewart and Barr. And we'll probably get someone else and then cut him next season. Uh, at fullback, nothing. Wide receiver, Jalen Clark, who I did not want to redshirt. We're going to redshirt him because we have so many guys ahead of him that are very talented and deserve the playing time. And between Willis, Riley, and Baker, I assume one of them will go to the NFL next season, which means that he'll have a much easier shot uh, to play, as well as Revels and Newsom are both getting redshirted. Armani Ferdinand, who I want to start, we just don't have the opportunity to do so with Miner and Gold ahead of him. He's getting redshirted. Uh, Mark Wood will be redshirted at left tackle. Left guard, we're not redshirting anyone. At center, we'll be redshirting Darius Bush. Uh, right guard, will be redshirting both Baker uh, and Beckwith uh, in that spot. Because, again, we have a sophomore ahead of them. We want to give them extra time to develop and then hopefully play in the future. At right tackle, we'll be taking Chris Wade and Saunders. A redshirt both of those guys. Left end, there's no one. Right end, we have three guys in Durant, Kenny Davis, and Joe Gums. At defensive tackle, we're going to have Amir Carson as our redshirt. Left outside linebacker, no one because... Steven Sams is probably going to be playing middle linebacker for us this year. At middle linebacker, no one. Right outside linebacker, we're going to have Tristan Howard. At corner, only one guy, Nate D. Ward, who is going to be an incredible player for us at some point. I just hope he progresses because he has all the makings that we need of a top-tier corner. Again, continuing that legacy. At free safety, no one. DeMille Hill is going to be starting there, though, as a true freshman. Strong safety, no one. Kicker, no one. And punter, no one. Some tough decisions, but ultimately, I feel like it's the best thing for our roster. Coming out of the gate for our schedule, I think we have three of the most difficult games we have probably ever had to start a season. We have a national championship rematch against Texas at number three. At week two, we go against number 16, Virginia. Week three, we go against number 11, USC. It's about to get crazy. Then we go to Baylor. Or sorry, then we play Baylor. Then we have a home game versus number one, Michigan. Why are they ranked number one? But I guess we lost a lot of players. Then we go Iowa. Illinois, Wisconsin, number 14, Nebraska. We play Minnesota. We have not won but two bye weeks, thank God. Then we go up against the LSU and Purdue. This is going to be tough. The quarterback position is going to be a crazy one, and I think Cedric Thornton can be that guy, but if he's not, we are in shambles. Kendrick obviously didn't have a great offseason. We are going to be great at running back with Jason Barr coming back for his senior year, and we're going to be great at wide receiver with so many talented players that are ready to step up and take over the reins of what has been an incredible lineage we've had here at this school. I am just worried about so many different spots in our team, and with so many ranked games against so many tough opponents, this is going to be the toughest season in Cascade Valley history. If you're excited for the season, do me a favor, leave a thumbs up. It helps out an absolute ton. Subscribe if you enjoyed this content because we have plenty of Cascade Valley episodes as long as you guys want to see them. At the end of the day, though, it's going to be a heck of a season. Be safe, be smart, tell somebody you love them. Catch you guys on the next one.